Hey, podcast listeners, it's Savannah here, producer of Corporate Competitor Podcast. And as you know, Dawn and our entire team became part of the Maxwell Leadership family in 2022. Well, today you have the opportunity to become our teammates too. There are many of you who are listening right now who would love to launch your own business or start coaching other people. And we have a phenomenal strategy where you are 100% in control of your own business. When you become a Maxwell Leadership Certified Team Member, you join a global community of entrepreneurs led by our expert team of mentors and faculty, including John C. Maxwell. Plus, you will get one of the top leadership certifications in the world next to your name, giving you the boost you need to get started. Visit us online at maxwellleadership.com slash join the team to find out more information. What do most Fortune 500 executives have in common? They learn important lessons on the fields and courts of their high school and collegiate sports teams. This is true for both men and women. Ernst & Young found that a whopping 94% of women holding a C-suite position played sports. Their wins and losses shaped their habits and who they would become. Join me on my journey to sit with some of the brightest executives in the world as we discuss how sports shape their professional trajectory. In partnership with Chief Executive Magazine, the voice of America's CEO community. I'm your host, Don Yeager, and this is Corporate Competitor Podcast. With me for today's episode is wonderful company Chief Financial Officer, Stephen Howe. The wonderful company includes brands you know and love like Fiji Water, Palm Wonderful, Wonderful Pistachios, and Justin Wines. Today, I am excited to talk to Stephen about his experience playing basketball for Oxford University, where his team won the British National Championship. He also coached two players in AAU basketball that went on to play in the NBA. But I think his greatest accomplishment is marrying his wife, Amy Howe, the CEO of FanDuel, who he had as a guest on episode 109. Before we jump in, visit corporatecompetitorpodcast.com slash 131 to download the free bonus resource we put together for you with fill-in-the-blank notes and reflection questions for today's episode. How you get things done truly matters. We evolved for hundreds of thousands of years looking for shoots and berries to eat, and then you hear a lion. You're not too worried about it, but you're kind of at threat level one. Now the lion's a little closer. Threat level three, you can't think creatively. You're kind of in flight or fight mode, and their brain is literally collapsing to provide greater energy to the body to get safe from this lion. Okay, now fast forward, we're now in an office-based environment people still feel threats. Stephen, thanks for joining us. It's great to be on your show. Thank you, Don. As you know, I'm a big fan of yours. I do have to say for all listeners that your wife, Amy, who currently serves as the CEO of FanDuel, was just named one of the most transformative CEOs of 2022 by Business Insider, was on episode 109 and talked about the grit she developed growing up on a farm trying to make it through those Buffalo, New York winners, and how playing sports really taught her how to manage her time. She quickly turned into one of my favorite people ever. <laughs> Thanks, Don. Obviously, I'm so proud of Amy and all she has achieved. I like to joke that when we were at McKinsey, she worked for me, and now I work for her. But uh, I can't imagine a better partner to go through this journey we call life with together. We have three fantastic boys, Grant, who's 16, Luke, 13, Dylan, 11, we just love them to pieces. And I think our family has been very blessed. We have a good team and we aren't making any trades. <laughs> That's awesome. Now, she shared much of the same passion about the unit that you guys are and the way that you guys collectively have shown what teamwork really looks like. I love that. So I want to ask about the name of where you work, The Wonderful Company. Wonderful is such an apt name for our company. And it really goes back to the owners, Linda and Stuart Resnick, and how wonderful they are and how much they're doing for the communities we operate in. They're the best bosses I've ever had. That's why I've been here wonderful for the past 12 years. 
And we really do look very hard at each product we offer. And we ask, is this a wonderful product? It has to be good for you. It has to be natural. It has to be sustainable for the planet. We really take that very seriously at Wonderful. And our products are the best in each category they operate in. Wonderful pistachios are the best pistachios. Wonderful halos are the best mandarins and clementines. Fiji water is the best tasting water. Justin Vineyards, Landmark Vineyards, Lewis Cellars, all part of our wine portfolio, and they're all such incredible wines. A restaurant at Justin Vineyards just won a Michelin star, which we're very excited about. For me, it's just a lot to be proud of that I get to go to work for this great company doing such great things. You all took the word and then defined it for yourself. What is a wonderful product? It's not that it has to fit in one specific vertical. The only thing they have in common is that they're wonderful. Yep. As a culture, that's got to be really wonderful. In every sense of the word, yeah. We take it very seriously. Even when we have a product like, you know, our palm juice, we blend it. But we want to be very clear on the label exactly what's in the juice blend so that the consumer knows when they buy the product exactly what juices they're getting. We just take it very seriously. I love it. You know, I was reading up about several folks who weighed in on your leadership skills. One of your colleagues, Daniel Brackens, describes you as a rare breed of leader and says you understand the value of teamwork and reaching out to everyone in the organization, that you actually are quite broad in the way that you seek opinions and guidance. Is there a life experience or lesson you've learned that might explain where that leadership chops come from? Sports has a lot to do with it. Some of it came from John Wooden, someone I deeply admire. When I was a young boy, I was coached by John Wooden at a small camp that a father of a friend of mine, Roger Milstein, arranged at Sherman Oaks Park. I was probably 10 years old. It was like a mini camp. It was a few days and Coach Wooden would come and he'd start by teaching us how to put on our socks properly as you know he always did. After the camp, Coach Wooden gave all of us a blue binded folder filled with printouts of sayings and aphorisms and poems and short writings that he liked. Some he wrote, some other people wrote. It wasn't really organized per se. It was just a folder binded with these pages and he gave it out to each member of the camp. I've kept it my whole life, mm. 40 years plus since he gave this to me. And I read it still, especially when I'm feeling down or going through something difficult. And it provides me inspiration to this day. And I will copy it and give printouts to people that I think would also enjoy it at work. I should give one to you, Don. I think you would love to see what he selected. And this binder was a poem by Rudyard Kipling. If, if you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are gone, and so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. Wow. I literally get goosebumps when I read it. If that doesn't speak to determination, then nothing really does. That's one of the coolest things about people like John Wooden. Little things they do will stay in your file cabinet for 40 years. Yeah. When my son was born, John Wooden wrote him a letter that still hangs above his bed. There you go. I mean, he was giving out a folder to a 10-year-old. 40 years later, we're talking about it. You have no idea the impact when we're interacting with other people. That's really true. It's very small things that you do can make a huge difference in other people's lives. Showing small amounts of kindness or attention, you know, helping people when they need a little help because we all need a little help sometimes. Yeah. Daniel Walker Howe, your father professor at UCLA and Yale and former Rhodes professor of American history at Oxford. He won the 2008 Pulitzer Prize for history. What an incredible achievement. How was your upbringing influenced by not only having a father who was a teacher, but having a father who had those kinds of elite credentials? You know, my father is a great man and my mother is a great woman. Together, they taught me so much. My father wasn't much of an athlete. He didn't really play sports. My mom was the one who was really into sports and got me into sports. She would coach me and play ball with me and take me all over creation to games and camps and practices. And she always taught me to hustle, try hard and practice. To this day, you know, we're still sports fans. You know, when a team in basketball loses because they missed their free throws at the end, she always comments on that. They should have practiced their free throws. Why didn't they make their free throws? Because in basketball, so much is outside of your control. There's 
the refs, there's your teammates, there's the other team. Free throws are completely in your control. So our view is always you got to make the free throws and you got to practice them so you can make them. I'm going to guess that Shaquille O'Neal's period in Los Angeles probably drove her crazy. (laughs) Um, Yeah. But my father taught me a love of history. I majored in history in college. I still read historical nonfiction to this day. I love American history. My senior thesis at Harvard was written on how the Northern press viewed Robert E. Lee in the American Civil War. And it got a sufficient grade that Harvard kept it. It's in the library there. So now anyone who wants to can go to the Harvard library, can check out my senior thesis and read it. Look, I'm so lucky to have had a privileged upbringing, to have had such great parents that invested in me and my brother and my sister and gave us so many opportunities that many people don't get. Now I try to do the same for my children. Mainly I try to teach them that if you really do your best, then things have a way of working out. It's the peak of the pyramid from Coach Wood. Absolutely. And the idea from your mother, free throws, fundamentals, the things you can control. Give me a business equivalent of the free throw. Having a project plan and working the plan. There's really no excuse. If you want to get something done, you need to come up with a plan and then you need to work that plan until the plan changes. That happens. The great Churchill quote, planning is everything, plans are nothing start with going through the exercise of planning and then working the plan. And that's within your control. And of course, in a business setting, a lot of things are outside your control. You have customers that can do things. You have competitors that can do things. You can have your own employees that unfortunately from time to time can mess things up. But if you've got a plan, if you're doing your homework and if you're working it, that's the equivalent of a free throw. Planning is everything. Plans are nothing. Yeah. Powerful. When I saw a list of the employee values of the wonderful company, they are built like a lesson plan. One of them says, we play to win. We are innovative, entrepreneurial, bold, and nimble. How does sports affect the way you look as a corporate executive on playing to win? All our values resonate with me, but that one really resonates with me because anyone who knows me will tell you how competitive I am, literally to a fault. I always want to win, even when I don't need to. On Thanksgiving, I play touch football each year with my three boys and all their pals. I'm now 51, and I should probably retire. (laughs) I thought maybe this year I'd just ref, but then the kids got together, and there's just having to be an odd number of kids, so one of the grown-ups need to play, and nobody else wanted to play. So I said, okay, I played every other year. I'll play one more year. Amy, before she always tells me, just don't get hurt. It doesn't else matter. Just don't get hurt. So, of course, I play. And on the second play of the game, I end up snapping a tendon in my finger. The injury is actually called Jersey finger in it. Now I've got a, a messed up finger and I can't play sports for three months, can't golf for three months, total nightmare. But you know, the injury happened. And of course, being me- You kept playing. I kept on playing. Right. I couldn't bend my finger. I just went to the quarterback and said, don't pass me the ball. I'm going to have trouble catching it. <laughs> you know, I still played as a decoy and did the best I can. And my team won. <laughs> I think it's my last game as a football player, but dang it, I'm going out a winner. Have them sign the ball for you. (laughs) Yeah, I know. So, you know, the most meaningless game of football ever played, I won. But I take that attitude into the workplace as well. I just love working for and being part of a successful organization like the wonderful company. We just love to win and we aren't perfect. But I got to say, I think this is the best run company I've been associated with in my professional career. In sports, winning and losing becomes pretty obvious. In business, there are so many other factors. How do you define winning corporately? You're right. There are so many factors. You can't just look at it one way. I mean, we're going to look at cash flow. We're going to look at profitability. How successful are our products in the marketplace? And that's a form of winning. Having healthy, natural, good for you products that we are proud of. That's another form of winning because, you know, we wouldn't want to take some unhealthy product into the market and sell it to people. We wouldn't feel good about that. That would be losing. Are we having a positive impact in the communities that we operate? That's another form of winning. And are we providing professional and job opportunities for our employees? We have 13,000 employees all over the globe. We take that responsibility seriously. We want to make sure that we're giving them an opportunity to be successful to achieve what they want in their career. And obviously that affects them and that affects their families and that affects their communities. Winning for us is all of those things and you've got to pay attention to all of them. You know, I love talking to executives at companies that have very well-defined values. 
I've been in organizations, asked employees to tell me about their values, and they have zero idea what they might be. Sometimes we post all that on the wall. It ends up on a website, but that may be as far as it goes. How do you celebrate when people embody the values that you all declare? Are there ways that you all celebrate that might be instructive to the rest of us? One thing that I'm awfully proud of, we launched an initiative to reform and standardize our performance review process a few years ago. I led it in my position as head of HR. We called it GROW, Goals, Recognition, and Ongoing Conversations at Wonderful. We measure all our office-based employees each year against our wonderful values. They get a rating and comments against each of the values. Do they live up to them? Do they exceed them? Everyone has this as part of their performance review in addition to whatever their specific goals were for the year. Here's the things you are trying to achieve, but here's how you got those done. Because what we don't want here are effective people, people who accomplish their goals, but they leave a trail of devastation in their wake and therefore prevent others from achieving their departmental or personal goals. So we want leaders that support others so that how you get things done truly matters, not just the what you get done. And as a senior leader, I need to be aware of the impact I have on a room. A guy named Dr. David Rock, he's a neuroscientist. He tells us great stories about how we evolved as a species. In Africa, for years, we were close to life and death. You might be out looking for shoots and berries to eat, and then you hear a lion, and the lion is in the next valley across You're not too worried about it, but you're a little more attentive. You're a little more focused. You're kind of at threat level one. Now the lion's kind of on the hill. You go to threat level two. It's a little closer. And the lion gets 50 yards away, you know, really close. You threat level three. At that point, you can't think creatively. You're kind of in flight or fight mode. How do I get safe from this lion? We evolved for hundreds of thousands of years in that environment. Okay, now fast forward. We're now in an office-based environment. There aren't lions around anymore, thankfully, (laughs) but people still feel threats. If you put someone in threat level three, they're not going to be able to think creatively. They're not going to be able to do complex problem solving. They're not going to observe things clearly. They're going to get into kind of fight or flight mode, and their brain is literally collapsing to provide greater energy to the body to kind of get away from the lion, even though there's no lion in the situation. You're the lion in the valley of what? Yeah, I can be. You know, I want to help my teammates be as successful as they can. If I walk into a room, I'm probably putting them to threat level one. That's maybe okay. You know, they're a little more focused, a little more attentive, a little stress is good. If I start publicly criticizing somebody, they're going to threat level three. I've just made it much harder for them to do their job, which obviously we want them to do well. So you got to have alignment around what you're trying to achieve. And we see this in the wonderful company time and time again. If we can invest time early on to build the alignment. You go slow, but then afterwards you go fast. And it's much better to do that than go fast and rush and do something without alignment because then you end up going slow. Building that alignment, go slow first to then go fast is very important. Shared values, as we talked about before, are a big part of it too, because if you can agree on the how in addition to the what, your team gets that much better. Mm. When you're interviewing, do they share our values? When they're onboarding, I talked about how in our performance reviews, we evaluate each of our employees each year based on how they're performing against the values. We really try to keep those front and center and we talk about them because they are just so important. If you don't have that gel around the organization, things just don't work as well. You know, I've learned that I have to be cognizant of the behavior I have in a room and in a situation How can I help my people be at their best when their best is needed? Wow. We don't often think about those things as leaders, that walking in the room creates threat level one. It's not just about sharing your values on a wall. It's about constantly making them a measuring tool throughout the process of someone's employment with you. Yeah. And there's a lot of great books on this topic, like The Wisdom of Teams, But one thing I'm proud of in the team that I've built here at Wonderful personally is that each of my directs is better at their functional area than I am. Hopefully I'm a good coach. Hopefully I'm an okay leader. Hopefully I can mentor people. But each of the people I have an opportunity to work with on a daily basis are real experts in their area of operation. Go out and hire the best people you can for the job and then do what you can to maximize their success. Right. Many people 
refer to teams when they talk about their organizations. But truthfully, most are not really teams. There are just a bunch of individuals who happen to have the same business card. You've been on them. You've been on successful ones. For those of us who are constantly trying to build our team to a place where they can achieve something special, is there some team building model that you've learned to follow? There's something to kind of selflessness and looking out for others. Look, people are smart. They can figure out pretty quickly, are you here for yourself or are you here for them? If you can interact with people and be there for them and not just for your own personal success, people figure that out. Oh yeah, this is a guy I want to spend time with. This is a person I trust. Building that trust is so critical in creating teamwork. Trust has to start with kind of selflessness that you show you're not just in it for yourself, you're in it for the other person as well. You know, that's so powerful. People have a certain amount of energy they have to bring to work every day. This is the required energy. It's that discretionary energy. If you can get them to give you that little bit more, which you can't make them do it. They have to make the choice to do it. The only way to encourage them to make that choice is to have that sense of selflessness. Yeah. And I love that phrase, discretionary energy. And it's something I think about and talk about a lot here at Wonderful because I can see it. You can see it as a boss and you can see it in yourself. There's just such a big difference when people put in that discretionary effort. And I think it's just so important to create an environment where people want to put in that discretionary energy. Yeah. You know, you spearhead the Wonderful Leadership Academy at Wonderful, which talks about the skills needed for career advancement. So you're working within your employee base to help them figure out how can they grow and advance their careers. How did the idea of an academy like that start? Oh, I love the question. So the Wonderful Academy was originally an idea I had based on the concept that McKinsey and Company, the consulting firm has. GE did at Crotonville back in the day. I wanted that training for our leaders as well. That kind of best in class training. Yeah. The wonderful company should have best in class training. We started small and built it over time. And one day I was sitting at my desk and I had an idea. We'd offered these leadership courses for directors in the company, for managers in the company. We shouldn't just work on leadership skills. We should also work on managerial skills because we have a lot of new managers as they come up in a big company. When you're a new manager and you haven't managed much before, you kind of don't know how to do it because you aren't born knowing how to manage others and you need to learn how to manage others. And a lot of that occurs in the job and a lot of it occurs by trial and error, unfortunately, but some of it can also be taught or learned from others. So much is new when you're managing others for the first time. I made a lot of mistakes. I'm pretty sure most people do. That doesn't just affect you. It affects the people you're managing. So I wanted to help people with that. I wanted to help new managers. How can they manage? I drew up on a whiteboard, the outline of a class, and I called it Wonderful Manager Essentials. I talked to people about it, and we developed it completely in-house, and we launched it. And the name actually stuck. To this day, we call it Wonderful Manager Essentials. And the feedback on the program has just been terrific. So many people I've seen benefit from this program and grow up in the organization and go on and take on new leadership roles. Jill Thacker, she's done such a great job rising up in the organization. Rachel Smith, rising up in our purchasing organization, taking on more and more. There's so many of our employees that I watch as their careers over time unfold and take their managership, their leadership really to the next level. And the other day, we had all our trainers together because I wanted to thank them for doing such a great job. We have really great learning and organizational development professionals here at the wonderful company. And somebody put up a picture that they took of that original whiteboard of the idea. And of course, since it was in my writing, it was completely messy and nobody could really read it, but I could read it. I was so happy and proud that we'd literally taken something from a whiteboard and translated it into reality that can help our employees. What I love is that there's a need to teach managerial skills. For a few years, that idea of, well, you know, managers just kind of do what they're told. The truth is there's a skill set to all of that. Absolutely. And nobody is born knowing it. Now, we talked earlier about how do you interview people correctly. So we've launched interviewer training so that we can make sure we're hiring people that are aligned with our values. If you just leave it to chance, who knows what you're going to get. What are some of the ways that you can ask the question in the interview process that will help you define whether they're aligned to your values? 
the classic example is, you know, give me one of your faults and, you know, I work too hard or I have too much attention to detail. Everybody knows how to answer that. You can't do those questions. You got to come up with different ones. Right. Look, it's a game. People know how to play it. But if you ask people to give examples of how they've achieved something and how they've overcome barriers, you have to evaluate how real are those barriers. Certainly, charming people can snow you, but ask people to describe an example of how they overcame a challenge in a previous career and their college experience. Really listen to what they're telling you and evaluate it. Is this somebody who tends to put in that discretionary effort to go the extra mile? And that's why you know it's good to prep people before they interview because interviewing is such a crucial job. I mean, that's how the future of your company enters. So if you're not doing a good job interviewing, you're not going to have good employees for the future. There is no greater place where you can impact the future culture of your organization. And it's really hard to do well. Yeah. You've also coached an AAU basketball team that ended up with two players on it that went to the NBA. If you didn't win every game with two NBA players. (laughs) We didn't win every game, but that's okay. (laughs) What did that experience of coaching very talented young people teach you? So I coached a team called Team Avia. I was in my probably mid-20s, and it was a AAU basketball team, and the head coach was a guy who I'd played for earlier in my life. Luke Walton played on the team, and he went on, of course, to coach the Lakers, and Eric Chenoweth played on that team and also went on to be drafted into the NBA. And we had a bunch of other really good players, too. Coaching elite athletes like that, it's a little less of sort of telling them what to do. It's more motivating them, getting them to play as a team, making sure they're focused and their minds are right about it. And especially young men in high school, having been one myself, can get very distracted. But it sure was a lot of fun. I'm sure we won one. I'm sure we lost some. I I can't really remember. But we still get back together. Our team of VIA, we have these team of VIA sort of reunions. We'll grab dinner every so often. I hope the NBA guys buy when you guys go to dinner. Yeah, I'll I'll mention that. (laughs) You know, at Wonderful Company, another aspect of what you lead in your department was the College Prep Academy. You guys operate two K-12 public charter schools, like 2,500 students. Your website talks about giving the students an edge. What does that edge look like when you guys are defining how to raise up young people? I'm so proud of wonderful support for them, for the surrounding communities and all the kids that have the opportunity to attend there. The education and philanthropy teams who work on this at Wonderful are really great, really world-class. The students come from hardworking, blue-collar families in the Central Valley of California. Traditionally, they haven't been provided a lot of opportunities, but they have made the best out of what they could. Now, with these schools they can attend, these kids are going to colleges at UCs, to Ivy League schools, to Harvard. I mean, it was previously unheard of in that community, and it has really changed. And those children and their families benefit, and society benefits because we're lifting up and providing opportunities to children who never had those opportunities before. And then those children can grow up and contribute to society in new and different ways. And Linda Resnick, to have had the vision to take this on and pull this off and create these schools and build it, it truly is wonderful. Well, it's good that we can continue to use that word. You know, we opened by talking about family. You have three sons. You mentioned them earlier. You have talked a lot about time together with them, including golf and fishing, shooting. I understand all of your sons play golf in tournaments. That's a sport that many people consider individual. What can you learn from? working around that kind of sport that can translate into business. Golf is an individual game, but when you're playing it, when you're going through the practice rounds or playing for fun, you're interacting with other people constantly while you're doing it. You spend four hours golfing, you can really get to know somebody. When I'm out with my kids, we're working on sort of basic things like behavior, eye contact, handshakes, take your hat off how to be polite, how to interact with people. Not a single one of those things has anything to do with a backswing or a putt. Yeah, no, it's like, how do you interact with people in the business setting? I see a very high correlation for you know people who, if they have a bad shot and they flip out and they throw clubs, you know exactly what that kind of person is. 
when I watch youth golf. If somebody gets way too excited when they get a birdie, I can always tell they're for sure going to get way too disappointed when they get a bogey. You want to kind of stay even. You don't want to get too excited. You don't want to get too down because golf, for whatever reason, it seems like there's a lot more downs than ups. It's one of the maddening yeah. things about the sport. <laughs> it's a four letter word. I mean, come on. That's just the way it is. So you've got to comport yourself. You've got to stay even keeled. And that's incredibly important in business too, particularly if you're a leader. Because if you're a senior leader and something goes wrong and you're flipping out, what do you think everybody else is doing? Be measured in your response, show the confidence that, yeah, there's a setback and now we're going to figure out how we deal with it. Because just like bad things happen to golf, bad things happen in business. And how are you going to deal with them? Golf, like free throws, like business, it's how much work you put in. If you grind and if you spend two hours chipping and putting and hitting your nine iron or whatever it is, when you get in the match, it's going to go a heck of a lot better than if you didn't put in that grind time. You're right. It is something you can control. I mean, your mother would be proud to practice the discipline, the diligence, and the energy. People that want to learn more about the company, want to learn more about you, any place they should look. You can go to wonderful.com and you can learn all about the wonderful company. For me, you can go to my LinkedIn profile to let me know you heard me on this podcast. We can LinkedIn together. Love to stay in touch with people. You know, happy to hear from anybody. Steve, I loved the opportunity to get to reconnect through Amy and to feel like I have a better view into your leadership style from today's opportunity. Thank you for being a corporate competitor with us today. Thank you, Don. It's my pleasure. What a wonderful conversation. It is so fun to talk to someone who is just so confident in the way they lead. Steve Howe is exactly that. There's so much of today's conversation that will make me better as a leader. I want to give you a couple of nuggets that really stood out. His entire conversation about being aware as a leader of what happens when you walk in the room threat level one, threat level three, what happens when you interact with the team that you lead and the requirement that we as leaders have to be aware of that, that it's not just a matter of knowing it. We have to then think about how it affects the way everyone in the room will act as we move forward. I also loved his discussion around teams and the idea of investing time early in a team building opportunity to build alignment, go slow to ultimately go fast. It was so powerful the way he described that they don't just ask about the shared values during the interview process. They don't just make them an important part of their onboarding. They also measure their teammates against the values in their annual reviews, creating the right energy that allows that discretionary energy to flourish within your team. I hope that you found as much wonderful content today as I did. And before we end the show, I want to give a shout out to Kate Sample, the president of the Sunshine Foundation, who reached out on LinkedIn to share how much she has enjoyed listening to episode 119 with Make-A-Wish CEO Richard Davis. Will you join Kate and leave us a rating and review? And if you'd like to stay in touch and connect with our team, do so at maxwellleadership.com slash Don Yeager. If you could share one habit, one thing you've done consistently that allowed you to separate yourself from your competitors, what would it be? In my 30 year career, 2,500 of the greatest athletes, coaches, and leaders answered that question for me. This is Don Yeager, who did that uh, I was, that article I was telling you about. Don Dave Sims with Coach K. How you doing? Hey, Don. How you doing, my man? Great, sir. How are you? What they gave to me is what I'm giving to you in my online course, Journey to Greatness. Through engaging storytelling and on-demand videos, you will learn the 16 habits that will jumpstart your personal growth. I will instruct you on how to apply these winning characteristics to your life through custom workbook exercises. We are slashing the price for our podcast listeners. Lifetime access to Journey to Greatness is normally $399, but for our podcast listeners, it will be $49 
with the code podcast at checkout. Click the banner on corporatecompetitorpodcast.com to enroll. Thanks for listening to the show. I would be so grateful if you left us a rating and a review. We will be rolling out a new episode every Wednesday. To be the first to listen, subscribe to the podcast on our website, corporatecompetitorpodcast.com. Plus, as a thank you gift, you will receive a free chapter from one of my best-selling books on the habits of high-performing teams. Stay in touch by connecting with me on social media at Don Yeager, Y-A-E-G-E-R, on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Until next week, I appreciate you.